everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Match Points with USPTA. I'm Ramona Husaro, and I'm super excited for my guest today, Lori Riffis. Lori, thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm uh, excited to uh, have, a, have this talk with you, Ramona. Awesome. Uh, Lori, I've had the pleasure of knowing you for many years. You're right next door. You have this amazing experience as a coach, served in many different roles, starting with coaching your own three sons, and then uh, being a private coach for many years up in Northern California, working with many different players of all levels. And of course, being a USDA national coach, working with some of the best players in the country. Super excited for our conversation today to really get to know more about your experiences and to help our coaches develop a better understanding about what it takes to develop a successful player and also how to better manage the relationship with the parents. So does that sound good to you? Absolutely, yes, thank you. I, I, I've had many different experiences in my in my life and so uh, hopefully one of one of the things we talk about can help some of the some of the coaches at home in the, in their programs great yes. there's not one way to do anything that's right awesome so why don't we get started by talking about your experience as a parent coach with your three sons i know that all three of them played competitive sports your oldest one played college baseball your middle son played high school basketball, mm -hmm. and your youngest, Sam Riffis, who we all know, is a former All-American at University of Florida, won the 2021 NCAA Singles Championship, and has now turned pro. So, <laughs> I mean, talk about a sports family, yeah. sports mom. Tell us about that experience and how everything got started for you. Yes, I do have three adult sons, age 23 to 30. And always from the beginning, we've been active. And so I'm very fortunate. My husband and I both like to do a lot of outdoor things. And so from the beginning, we would bring the boys to tennis. We would bring them to shoot baskets. We'd bring them bicycling. And they all through time wanted to learn tennis. And it's been really interesting because as parents know, the kids are different, although the parents are the same. And so there could be one of my sons that might have more potential to be a better tennis player, but doesn't have the interest. And a great example is that is my oldest son, whenever he had free time, he would ask us to go play wiffle ball in the street. And when Sam had free time, he would always ask us to play tennis. So from the beginning, there was just a little more interest. However, when we get together for family time, um, they all live across the nation, but when we get together for holidays, we play tennis all together. And uh, Sam plays with us and it, it's fun getting together and, and enjoying tennis. That's great. I mean, it sounds like a blast, especially getting to do all the activities with your children and spending time together as a family doing sports. I think that's, that's great. So let's talk a little bit more about Sam, because I'm sure our coaches in the audience would like to know more about his journey. Did you coach Sam at the beginning? How did that get started? Yeah, well, we had um, a unique situation. Sam's the youngest of three sons. And um, when he started playing tennis, we were actually living in the mountains in Northern California. And he would be done with kindergarten at noon and we'd have to wait in town until the boys got out of school at three. And so we would uh, go to the gym and play tennis inside the racquetball courts. Or we would go to the outside park if, if, there wasn't, if the weather was good and we would play tennis. And we would just do that. He got good at it, he enjoyed it. He watched his brothers play tennis, you know, before that time living in the mountains. Pretty soon he's, he's eight years old and we're on court and it's like he would say to me from the baseline, mom, how come you're not telling me what I'm doing right or wrong? And it's like, if I'm not out here getting better, what am I doing out here? So right from the beginning, he had a desire to do it the right way and to learn. That is impressive. Which is unique because the other two, you know, not so much, you know, they were, they were enthusiastic about their interests as well. And uh, Sam's interest has always been tennis. Very interesting. So staying on that note, did you end up coaching him at the beginning for several years? And how did that go? What did you guys focus on at that time? Yeah, we focused just on hitting, just having fun. I, at that time, was younger and enjoyed the exercise. We would just hit balls. His personality always brought him to the net, so we'd always do volleys. So he learned the skills and I was able to help him out technique-wise. When he was 11, his forehand, I just couldn't get it right. And so I, I looked throughout our area. I'm from Sacramento, California, and I taught for 25 years at Johnson Ranch Racquet Club in Roosevelt, California. 
and we had a pro that I liked his forehand the most, Amin Caldy. He's still at Gold River Racquet Club. And we started working with Amin twice a week for an hour and helping him with his forehand. And I would always spend time with him on court and it would be, Sam, what does uh, Amin want you to do with that? And then Sam would tell me, well, he wants me to do that. And I say, I don't know if that's what he wants. Are you sure? Let's call him. So I would just be the eyes and the practice partner from that point on. And thus I was at a tournament with him and he asked me. So Amin started coaching him when he was 12. And then when he was uh, 13, he started getting more opportunities at player development here in Florida. Thanks for sharing that. I think you're bringing up such an important point that I'm sure a lot of our coaches have experienced, maybe with some of the parents that they see at their clubs, where like yourself, a parent decides to take a step back and allow other people to kind of take over and coach their child rather than maybe staying on as the primary coach. So from your experience as a private coach and also working with the USDA, your thoughts on the positives of doing that? Yeah. Well, for, for us, it worked out. I'm not saying that this is the only way. It worked out for us. I couldn't turn off my tennis brain when I went home, and I wanted to be a mom longer than a tennis coach. And so I wanted to turn my tennis for when I'm on the court with him and when he was asking me something. And then when we came off the court, I just wanted to be a mom. He had brothers. I wanted to just lead a, a regular life. I know for some parents, that's the hard part. If I wanted to talk tennis with Sam, and I still do to this day, it's like, Sam, let me know when you wanna talk about tennis because there's something I wanna to talk to you about. So I respect his time, and I'm only gonna bring it up when he's uh, willing to talk about it, and he's got an open mind, and he, he's just such a sweet guy. His goal is to be the best tennis player he can be. He's always like, thanks, Mom, I appreciate you telling me. You know, I know that's not always the case, and um, there's certainly been times that I've presented information that wasn't at the right timing, so I didn't always get that response. But I, I just think that the boundaries have to be respected, and for me, it was really hard for me to be a tough coach and have him do certain things because as a, as a mom, I, I didn't want to step over that line. I wanted to support him and encourage him and let someone else take that tougher role. Did you feel like it was a little bit easier for you to witness that other people were coaching him and maybe being a little tougher on him that you were willing to be? Well, yes, for Sam's benefit, but no, as a parent. I mean, it's always hard watching your, your child go through a tough time. Right. But if, you know, for Sam's goal, it was definitely better. At times it was like, why am I paying Amin to tell him the same things that I know, already know to tell him? And not that I know everything, but absolutely no regrets. We just found a perfect fit for Sam. Sam still has the relationship with him today and it just worked out for us. I really appreciate you sharing that because I think it's such a common aspect that we see in tennis, right? Where it's so important for parents to be able to have this long relationship with their child over the years, whether they're coaching them or not. And I like the way you, you stressed that, that you were, it was more important to you to have that good relationship off the court than it was about coaching him and that other people could, could take on that role. But that doesn't mean that, you know, if you're willing to do that, of course, you, you, you can continue Continue coaching him. Yes, absolutely. I think every situation is different. Every parent's different. Every child's different. For us, that was the role I wanted, and that that worked out. So let's talk a little bit more about Sam's game and how it developed from being a junior to becoming such a strong college player and then having the opportunity to turn pro. What are the things that he added to his game throughout this time? Ah, that's, that's a great question. It's been a long journey. He started out as a junior with good fundamentals. So he was always able to keep the ball in play. And what he did was really look to come forward because that's what he likes to do. He likes to come to the net, whether it's a swing volley or, or just drop shot and follows, that type of thing. What I've learned and, and really that it wasn't, I wish I can say I had this incredible vision, but it's just what he enjoyed doing. And so we just, Make, made sure that he was able to execute those things. But as a junior, he had a game that can translate to the pro level. And that's what I look at as a national coach when I watch girls play is, do they have a game that can actually translate to a pro level game? And so obviously Sam needed to get better in a lot of areas. I'm not saying he was outstanding as a junior. It's just he had the, the bones, the structure to become there. So 
Through the junior years, he was still developing that. He had some opportunities to turn pro before college. And he felt he wasn't quite ready to turn pro. He still wanted to develop in college. Luckily, he had a lot of good choices of which college to go to. He chose the University of Florida, and it was just a very, very successful four years because the coaches had a, a good vision of, of where Sam needed to develop. We all agreed on that vision. Sam just year by year kind of worked on it. For instance, one of his goals freshman year was to uh, gain more weight. Not necessarily build more muscle because he wasn't trying to, to really bulk up, but he was six foot two, not weighing a lot. So that was freshman year goal. And then sophomore year goal, he was uh, working on something else. So every year he was, he was improving and he's still got a little bit of a list of, of things he's got to do better and luckily he's, he's got that history of okay I'm going to try to get better at this now I'm going to get better at this because any good pro still tries to develop their game and Sam's at the start of the, his career path so hopefully he can continue that work ethic uh, as he continues to develop. Absolutely I mean I, I'm so impressed with the goal setting the clear goal setting that he had since he was a little boy and now he's constantly trying to develop a goal for each year or a short-term goal versus a long-term goal. It seems like he has a clear picture of where he wants to go and how he can get there. And I think that that's obviously paid off over the years. Yes, thank you, thank you, yes. We've always, I don't, I don't know if other families do this, but as a family, we would sit together on New Year's Eve and um, kind of not necessarily write down New Year's resolutions, but write down certain goals and things. And he's just always been that way. You know, I'm gonna have a goal, and then I'm gonna check it off the list and, you know, move on. And and with tennis, as you know, you want an area of focus, uh, one or two areas of focus at all times that right. they continue to work on. So he's still uh, following that model. Right, great. So that brings up another important point that I'm sure a lot of our coaches deal with on a, on a daily basis, where maybe some of the parents are emphasizing early success, where they want their child to you know, win every single match that they play, be the best ranked player in the state or, or nation, and maybe don't focus on that long-term development or that large picture, the, the long-term goal that we just discussed. What are your thoughts on that? And how do you get a parent to buy in to that long-term development? So as a national coach, some of the things I talk to my uh, parents about is that if you're wanting your daughter to win right now at 12 and unders, at 14 and unders, my first question is, is this how you want your daughter to play at the US Open? Oh no, they're gonna get better. It's like, okay, well, if they're gonna get better, then they have to have some comfort level in failing because the best athletes are creative, they experiment, you know, they play freely. And if you're only thinking about the outcome, you know, we've all had this discussion, it, it just puts pressure on the child and it takes away their ability to actually develop. So my first tactic is just bringing it to, to light in that if this is as good as she's gonna get, then let's focus on winning. But if you think she can get better, then let's focus on developing. Right. And it sounds like like a coach would need that coaching philosophy that is very clear and on point, right? Because when the player comes to you for help, you are responding based on your values and what you're standing for, right? So if that's kind of part of your coaching philosophy, that could actually help in the long run. That's a great idea, Ramona. And, and I'm a big believer in creating a development plan for your players. And I know for some of the coaches out there with big programs, it's very challenging, but it's mostly protection as a coach, because if I can identify some of your areas that you're developing, then we can have a clear path of actually getting better. Because when you get better at one of the areas we've identified, then I can create a new development path. and. The player starts to get confidence that he or she's actually getting better. The parents feel like their investment is a good investment and then we're actually making progress. So I've always said good things are gonna happen, you know, to people that do the right things. And so if you're working on the right game, if you've identified it and you're actually progressing through that, the results will come. Right, right. I like that. The development plan is such an important aspect of, of being able to execute and stay committed and also be held accountable for your progress, your effort, and therefore your progress, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's just written proof for everybody involved. 
Great. So we talked about developmental plans and that would translate into getting the parents to buy in into that coaching philosophy and getting on board with a developmental plan. How important it is for coaches to plan parent meetings to get the parents on board and to, to kind of explain the plan of action? Very important and very difficult. Or not difficult, but challenging. Right. We all know that different parents out there with different ideas and different beliefs and we want them to be on board with us. We want them to be long-term development. And this is what poses the problem. And this is why a development plan is so important. So I think there's a couple ways that we could meet with parents. Number one would be maybe twice a year for the development plan, just going over it. It could be as quick as 30 minutes. It could be 45 or an hour, but going over what's been improved, what needs to improve. Also on a development, when it identifies the roles of each person, whether it's the parent, the player, or the coach. So it's a really good time to remind the parent what their role is. If there is some interference with the parent, that's a good time to identify that. But also, it might be a fun idea for people that have different programs to have like a monthly pizza night with parents and let the kids go out on the courts and let them have free play, which as a nation, we're not as good at as other nations. All the kids generally have structured play. Let them go out and play dink or ping pong or anything out there and have the parents with some type of meeting. And there's, I know USPTA has so many great resources online. I mean, you can have a topic a month and just uh, maybe have a potluck or pizza and get the parents together. But I think the, the, the coaches out there will have a very successful program if they're culture or their themes of what their academy is are clearly communicated. And what better way to do that than with parent meetings, whether it's privately with the development plan or as a group. For me, working is so much more fun to work when the kids are give 100% effort, have a great attitude, the parents stay within their roles. It's just worth the extra work to create that culture, I think. Absolutely. I think you bring up such such important points and I would love to kind of expand on that. You mentioned the parent involvement. Can you give us some examples of what should the parent involvement protocol be like? Well, that could be that could be different based on whatever the coach feels is necessary. We have some programs across the nation that maybe no parents are allowed watching on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We only have parent viewing on Monday, Friday, or you have a a cutoff area where parents aren't allowed past, you know. There's also some literature that define a positive parent role and a negative parent role based on the age of the player. So for instance, if your player is under the age of 14, a positive parent role would be providing transportation, financially paying the coaches, organizing travel to tournaments, you know, buying whatever particular foods or drinks are required, those types of things. But the negative role of a parent at that age would be um, being over-involved, talking too much tennis, especially at dinner, you know, negative or interfering with the coach. I get a kick out of the fact that sometimes like people come to Florida and they and they want maybe a, a national coach to hit with their child. I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to give an assessment or my idea of what should be developed next. They're standing there coaching their, their child while they're on court with me. And it's like you traveled, whatever, 10 states away, you know, to get my input. You know, why are you telling your daughter what to do right now? You know, and I know you guys get it out there at your programs. Uh, we get it here. So it's just setting boundaries. And, and giving them that information and then holding them accountable for it. I think your players will probably play better as a result of that. Parents won't be so frustrated because they'll realize it's kind of out of their hands. You know, they, they've got their roles. So it, it can be defined, the roles can be defined, whatever the coach can, can create, I think. I think that's, that's super important. And I really like the fact that you're emphasizing the importance of setting boundaries, setting boundaries and making sure that everybody understands basically their role into the evolution and progress of, the, of that player and understanding that based on their action, it could be, there could be positives or negatives, right? We've seen on a number of occasions where maybe parents get a little bit too involved. They, they even start coaching, like you were saying, they get on the court and maybe their behavior is impacting the, their own child's performance, overall behavior, and maybe 
you know, eventually losing interest over the sport. Can you share with us, maybe you've had that experience with, with some of the parents. What did you do in that situation? Yeah, absolutely. We understand that it's a big investment for the parents. Financially, they have a lot of hopes on their son or daughter reaching the goals. You know, we all do as parents. We all want what's best for our children and, and for them to reach their goals. So it's just having those difficult conversations with the parents, letting them know that your action right now is showing that you care and that you want to be heard and that you're not you know, in favor of the, what your son or daughter is doing, but you have to understand that it's it's not helping, and this is why it's not helping. And and having that discussion with the parent um, so they can do it. Now, believe me, there's going to be parents out there that it'll go in one ear and out the other, and unfortunately, that's the case. I mean, we have a we have a sport that costs a lot of money, and so we have some some pretty affluent parents that run businesses that feel they should run their son or daughter's tennis career. I don't want to oversimplify it by saying all you have to do is talk to the parent, but the parent needs to learn like what's working, what's not working, and this is why it's not working, and it's impossible for me to do my job if you, you know, interfere that way. Right, and that brings us back to what we said earlier about explaining kind of the coaching philosophy, the development plan, setting boundaries, boundaries yeah. and having meetings, right? Yeah. Kind of keeping the parents updated with what they're doing, uh, how is the son or daughter doing based on that development plan. And basically parents want to know what is going on, right? Yeah. So as long as they feel involved in that process, the, it's probably going to be a win-win situation. Exactly, Ramona. I think that's the most important thing. They just they just want to be involved. They want to know what's going on. The reason why this this all, if they do exactly what you said, that was a perfect summation of, of how to help a junior and how to help a, maybe a difficult parent. But the parent needs to learn that when the child gets to be 14, 15, 16, they're going to choose to not play tennis anymore, which is every parent's nightmare. They do have to back off a little bit so that the child when they become a young teen, a young adult, make that choice to still love tennis and still want to get good at tennis. So can you give us some examples of what a long-term development plan involves? Absolutely, I think, the, I think the key thing is that we want the parents feeling like their son or daughter is making progress. We actually want their child to make progress and we want them to play tennis as long as they can, right? We, we just don't want them to quit, so to speak. And so on a development plan, I think the most important thing is developing skills so that a player can play in the back court, the mid court, and the front court. So oftentimes, at least at the 13 and under, 12 and under junior girls level, um, what I see are, are players that are really good from the baseline. And you can tell a lot of their training is from the baseline. But they're not as good at getting those short balls mid-court. They're not as good at the continental grip skills at the net. They're not as good at the serve. And so we just want to make sure as they're learning, they're learning all those skills. Now, now the hard thing that we have to get the message across to parents is that not everyone can be a tennis player on TV. I mean, my son won the NC2As and he's fighting out there to be a, a top pro. I mean, it, there's like less than 1% chance of a college athlete becoming a, a top pro. And so we as parents, and now I'm wearing a parent hat as well, we have to think big picture because we, we have to convince the parents, and, and it's not hard to do, but we have to convince the parents that they're giving an opportunity for their child to really be enriched in so many ways. I mean, yes, skill development. I mean, you guys out there as coaches are, are all doing an excellent job with their skill development, but we're creating opportunities for these kids to develop these incredible life skills. And we're creating situations where parents get to travel with their kids and have these life skills. Other sports don't have that because there's team sports and they're going with their teammates. And maybe there's someone on the team that you don't really want your son or daughter around. I can't think of all the one-on-one the -on -one time that I got to have with my son that I would never give away. And so those are just 
incredible opportunities. Another thing is that tennis really creates so many great problem solving skills. I mean, the best tennis players are the best problem solvers. And we, we have study after study that shows that the CEOs of companies, the presidents of companies are all former tennis players because they've learned how to take care of their own needs. They've learned how to make decisions quickly. Also, most of the female CEOs are tennis players. I mean, most of the leaders that are female are tennis players. And so as a parent or a coach of a female player, I mean, it's only one of two, there might be arguably three sports that if your daughter's a good athlete can make money from. Tennis is one of them. And so I would just, as a coach, spend some time developing life skills because I think more parents than, than you think will, will find that as a benefit and, and find that enriching for their, for their son or daughter besides just w winning or losing. It'll take their focus off winning or losing and, and give them more of a, oh yeah, this is, this is really good for my, my, my son or daughter. Great insight, great insight. I like the way you emphasized how, you know, the skills, the skill development is important, but at the same time, it's really about learning how to handle certain situations that will help you basically in the long run, developing an athlete on and off the court, a, a good, a solid, strong human being on and off the court that will help them eventually in life and, and becoming a strong individual after tennis. Absolutely, and you know what? That's a hard message to get across. We're in an era called snowplow parent. We have a lot of parents that want to push all obstacles out of their kid's way. You know, think of the college admission scandal, but it, it is something that we are continually working with our parents with, and I think that will help the programs across the nation to maybe have the parents back off a little bit, you know, to create this independence and accountability from, from the players, because it is a life skill. I mean, eventually, every parent wants their kids to move out of the house. And so these are skills that we want our kids to learn. So on that note, I think you bring up a, a really important point. Tennis teaches us how to overcome failures, right? We lose a lot of matches and we learn from those mistakes and we get back up, we go practice and we go play another match. So how do you see that translating into learning how to fail in life as well and then coming back up stronger and doing better after that? Oh yeah, I mean, gosh, it's daily, right? I mean, it's, it's daily. If we're pushing ourselves, we're, we're learning something daily. And so we're teaching the kids that that's okay, that loss was information. You know, now you know, what do you have to get better at? You know, and I think it's just so valuable. There's a great uh, short little documentary out there. It's called In Search of Greatness. I think you can find it on YouTube and it goes over Michael Jordan, Wayne Gretzky, Serena, like how did they get so good? And the, the, the common theme with all those athletes is they were creative, but they just went out on their own and tried. And they failed, and then they did something different. And then they failed, and then they did something different. What, what great lesson to teach our, our, our kids that they're gonna, hey, they're gonna be hit with different challenges in their life. I mean, how real is that in our life, right, Ramona? has as uh, women professionals. So you just got to keep, keep trying, keep, keep finding a way to do something different. We call that resilience, you know? That's right. Just find a way to, to, to make it better and learn from it. So to summarize and kind of going back to that developmental plan, it sounds like we would focus on maybe on a physical aspect, on a technical aspect, on a tactic and strategy aspect, and also on the mental character development aspect to really develop that well-rounded individual on and off the court. And it sounds like that's what Sam was, was thinking early on as well. And you were thinking that well, as yeah, parents. Well, yeah, gosh, we just got lucky there for sure. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a great thing. You can, we, we do have a blank copy of the development plan on our playerdevelopment.usta.com website. I'm sure USPTA also has great resources. It could be anything. It can be like they learn how to dress better. You can put whatever you want to want to work on on all those aspects of development for sure. So let's go back to kind of discussing parents and how to better deal with parents. And we know that an important aspect and a common challenge that we see is the ride home from tournaments, right? We know that the ride home is a challenging moment for many players where they're, you know, riding back to from the tournament and they're listening to the parent maybe expressing disappointment in their performance or the result. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh -huh. what, what is the best way for coaches to work with the parents to get them to improve that aspect? Yeah, well, 
I can admit, as a parent, I certainly had my bad ride homes. Just gotta apologize. You just gotta apologize and you know try to get better at it. I think as a coach, what's important is that we don't want our parents talking tennis with the players until like the next day. I mean, we really want a cooling off period. That's what we push for. If the child brings it up like anything, then yes, the parents can listen. But really, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you've ever been an argument as an adult. I mean, you're gonna say things that you regret in the heat of the moment. And um, as adults, we can step back and apologize and then accept that. But as a parent on the car ride home, we wanna pull ourselves from that stressful situation, the emotional situation, because we very well could say things that we're gonna regret and we just wanna talk with cooler, cooler heads. Sometimes the kids need to decompress and, and share things and talk about it. And then we just listen. She says, yeah, that was too bad. Well, good try. You know, what, what do you wanna focus on? What do, you, what do you think you should be practicing on? Yeah, that was a bad call. Boy, it seemed like there was a lot, huh? Yeah, I, it's gotta be tough to make line calls. I mean, just maybe passive listening type of things and uh, really detach from the, the scene because there's nothing positive that's gonna come from a car ride home in which the emotions are not controlled. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I think you bring up another important point about, and I think you and I have talked about this in the past, where sometimes as a parent, you you said, I think you, you put your, your parent hat on and you take off the coach hat and you put your parent hat on. And from there, you're just a parent and you're just trying to listen and support them in any way you can and really focus on their effort and understanding their own disappointment as well. Because at the end of the day, they're the first ones that feel that yeah, disappointment. Yeah, they're not trying to lose. Right, Yeah. right. And I think that's such an important uh, point to bring home that really you're just trying to be a parent for them at that point and nothing else really matters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, Lori, so to kind of summarize everything, we talked about a lot of different things. The, the most important aspects about successful junior development, long-term development, and then parent coaching. Your thoughts? Well, to me, and, and again, this is just kind of my, my thought, I think, I think it's very important that the child have fun. And, and I'm not talking about fun, silly, ha ha, let's goof off, but the, the training has to be something they enjoy. They have to have an environment they enjoy, whether it's super structured or whether it's super free play. They have to have friends there. They, they have to know that the coach cares about them. They have to want to get out there and have fun. Whether um, I was a big believer in, in tournaments, going out to dinner with other parents, letting the boys have fun together, and we're still friends, you know, uh, 12 years later after the process. So I think the first key is fun. And then the second key is gonna be develop all the tools of the game. We, we say you, wanna, you want all the tools on your tool belt. I, I think it's really important that they learn all the skills so that they have more success to platform and get better. You know, we don't, we don't wanna have them get too old too fast and not learn certain skills because then they're gonna turn away from the sport. I think those are the, the, the important aspects of, of long-term development and hopefully keeping a junior involved in the sport. Great, and about parent coaching, any other things that you would like to add on that? I would just pick and choose when. I, I think it's really important that you, you pick and choose when you're a coach and when you're a parent. The example you gave uh, was a great example. Like when my hat's on a certain way, I'm a coach. You can talk to me about tennis, but if I'm not wearing that hat, I'm, I'm a parent. Just respecting boundaries. You know, although it's always in your mind as a parent, it might not always be in your son and daughter's mind. And, and the child really needs to know that they're loved, whether they're a tennis player or not. And because hopefully they're having fun and because they're learning all the right skills, they're gonna continue to choose to play tennis. Okay, Lori, thank you so much for that. So every episode ends with three match points. What are three main takeaways that you would like our coaches to remember from today? Okay, three main takeaways. Number one has to be long-term development. As I was mentioning earlier, learning all the skills of the game, being competent at the front court, the mid court, and the back court. That's definitely our first match point. All right, so what about second? Our second match point has to be establishing some type of culture for your program. That can include boundaries for parents, 
effort or attitude for your players, just establishing certain boundaries or expectations so that you know what your job is, the parents know what their role is, and the players know what their role is. All right, and the third? Okay, our third and final match point has to be, as a coach, holding the parents and the players accountable. So holding them accountable for, for playing tennis the right way, holding parents accountable for appropriate conduct while they're viewing tennis, while they're uh, you know, giving them information for the car ride home, uh, any of that. It's just doing, the coach needs to do their part to hold the parents accountable for making sure that, they're, that your student has a chance to actually uh, succeed. Excellent. Lori, thank you so much. You are, like I said at the beginning, a wealth of knowledge. Oh, I wish, thank you. I wish thank we you. had more time to really go into more detail because it's such an important topic. But thank you so much for taking the time to share th this with us. This was great. Well, thank you. It, it, it was fun to bring back some old memories with Sam uh, when he was a young boy. And uh, I, I appreciate it. Be best of luck out there to, to everyone. I, I know you guys are doing a great job. And thank you, for, thank you very much for today. Thank you, Lori. Mm -hmm. That was it for today. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time.